we need grace to trust you more we try to trust you but sometimes our faith fails us our human strength is not enough but oh for grace to be able to trust you more for you are trustworthy and we say thank you I just got to thank you for another week don't have to be here it's by your grace it's by your mercy and so thank you open our hearts so that we can hear the Word of God today there's somebody that's here Lord that's whose heart is broken they have a burden something's bothering them something they're struggling with but thank you that we can come today to your throne of grace boldly and find help in time of need Lord I want to just pray for Nations for Community Church right now where Bishop Davis was the pastor I pray for his son who's gonna be preaching today I pray for the church in their grief I pray for the pastors that I spoke to on Friday morning and those pastors touch them today as they mount the pulpit give them strength to be able to proclaim with clarity conviction power that Jesus is the Christ and besides him there's none other so take complete control of everything that goes on in this house today and whatever is accomplished we'll say yes to your will in the name of Jesus we pray and give thanks if you're not ashamed go ahead and say praise God and amen I'm so glad you are here I hope you said a big amen because the Browns got to play today you go ahead and be seated Brown's got to play today and I know you're gonna be shouting over there so hopefully you're gonna be shouting here giving the Lord that shout the um, last Sunday at the 1030 a.m. service you need to know what happened so that you are you know, when you have two different services different things happen Amen. and we were preaching about sacrifice last Sunday and yeah, people got up and began to bring offerings to the altar and we don't do that we don't make that a practice and we're not going to make it a practice but something God was doing last Sunday and so folks I didn't stop it because I thought God was up to something and we raised about an extra ten thousand dollars last Sunday so I know God was up to something now, I see folks do a whole lot of things, but one of them ain't give money. Okay, they do a whole lot of stuff, but that was, that's God moving at that particular. And uh, just let me let you know that most of the money that was brought to the stage on, in the second service was made out to the church. So don't, don't worry. Somebody emailed me and said, what happened to that money? It went to the church. Um, uh, any that said Bishop Joey Johnson, it went to me. Um, but it was very little of that. Most of it was given to the church, and we praise God for that. Amen? Amen. So even though we didn't have that movement here, you weren't, nobody got up and came. That's okay, because you can still give it in the offering today when we get done, when you walk out. We've all heard the story of the black Baptist preacher who began to preach one Sunday morning, and, and Deacon Jones was really getting into it. And as he moved into the more emotional part of the sermon, he said, this is God's church. And God wants this church to walk. Let the church walk. And Deacon Jones said, let it walk, Red. Let it walk. Pastor said, this is God's church, and he wants his church to run. Let the church run. Deacon Jones said, let it run, Red. Let it run. Pastor said, this is God's church, and God wants his church to fly. Let the church fly. Deacon Jones said, let it fly, Red. Let it fly. Pastor said, in order for the church to fly, it's going to take some money. Deacon Jones said, let it walk, Rev. <laughs> let it walk. That kind of attitude has precipitated armed robbery in the church. And this is our stewardship month, and I'm not playing any gimmicks and trying to get you to give money. I'm just preaching 
good old-fashioned gospel messages. So that's what happened last Sunday when there was no intent on my part to orchestrate an offering or people to come down. That wasn't even what we were talking about. We were just talking about sacrifice. And God got in somebody's people's heart and they began to pour out sacrifice. And I've gotten reports already that God has blessed their sacrifice. God is good. But armed robbery in the church can be seen in Malachi, the third chapter in the eighth verse. I will read the 8 through 12 for our hearing today. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me, but you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offering. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven. Pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Then I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will, be, will not destroy the fruits of the ground. Nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. All the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. May the Lord have the blessing of the reading of his holy word. Word of God, go ahead and be seated. Could I just get one amen? amen? Thank you. Thank you. I feel better now. I was speaking on Thursday morning, and I'll tell you how that went to a, seven, a room of 700 law enforcement officers who at, whose emotions were very muted. So they wasn't saying nothing. I couldn't get them to laugh or do nothing hardly. So I'm amen starved this morning. <laughs> But I'll be able to move on now. I got my one amen. I can, whew, man. It was a rough crowd, but I'll tell you about that in a minute. <laughs> got to keep in mind the history of the nation of Israel is a checkered one. It's not a story of their faithfulness of God, but of the grace of God in spite of their unfaithfulness. Look first at the charge, the indictment. The charge, the question is a charge or indictment. Will a man rob God? God seemed to be surprised himself. The questions that come to mind are, can a human being rob God? And what person would even dare to rob God? I mean, who would pull out their gun and say, God, stick them up? <laughs> who would dare to rob God? And, but he says, yet you are robbing me. Another indictment had been added to the list that had already begin, been given if you had read through the previous chapters because of the hardness of the heart. Do you think the Israelites are now ready to admit their sin? Think again. They asked another question. So how have we robbed thee? And this allows God to complete the charge in tithes and in offering. The Israelites were unwilling to concede that God was right, so they continued to ask questions until God answered. The Israelites' sin was twofold. First, they were evidently weren't bringing the whole tithe into the storehouse, and we gather from that the tenth verse where God commands them to do just that. But we also can go forward, and we can we have to deal with the myth that the children of Israel gave a tithe or ten percent to God in the temple. So I'm gonna straighten some of that stuff out today, because some folks like you know ten percent that's a whole lot of money to give, but that that's not what they gave. The actual the tithe consisted of three tithes for the Israelite. Two brought yearly and one brought every three years, which consisted of 23 and a third percent of their income, which was both for the maintenance of, of the temple and worship and for acknowledging of God's provisions. Secondly, we've got to deal with the myth that tithing is null and void in the New Testament because they were legislated for the children of Israel under the law of Moses, when in actuality, tithing began with a Gentile. Abraham was a wandering Aramean, a Gentile from the nation of Syria. And even though he was progenitor of the Jews, and the Jews were the descendants of the grandson of Jacob, grandson of Jacob, and oh, his name is also called Israel. Tithing originated before the age of the law in Genesis. There was no law when Abraham tithed the tenth of his spoils from the battle with Ketelamer to Melchizedek. And number four, the argument from silence in the New Testament continues to tie. There is no verse which specifically does away with tithing in the New Testament. Back to the text. Thirdly, the Israelites were bringing their offering to the storehouse. And they were bringing heave offerings probably and tithes. So everything which the Israelites were giving uh, offering, that's voluntary. And uh, it's a, not a sacrifice. The others were 
tithe. So we see here tithes which were prescribed and offerings which were voluntary or not prescribed. But the charge here probably has much to do, not so much with just their, what they were giving, but their attitude. God expected the Israelites to give to him with an attitude of cheerfulness and joy. People are habitually telling us that God demanded the tithe. That's utterly at variance with the true position. God only demanded the tithe as a minimum. And they had carelessly given him exactly what he asked for, the minimum. They robbed God in that they had not responded to the divine claim in the spirit in which it was made, but had offered that which was allowed by the measurement and rule then, rather than in the spirit of love. What is that but arm robbery at the altar of Jehovah? That when somebody has blessed you and, and they say, uh, you know, would you do this for me? And you do just that. Nothing more. And grudgingly. Has anybody ever given you a ride somewhere and not charged you? And you decided you would just give them a little bit to help them along? But what if they asked you for some money? So I, would you just give me $10 on gas? You say, well, sure, I'll give you that. You, you gave me a ride, but I ain't giving you no more than 10. Okay, I'm going to give you just that. Be happy. That's the attitude that the Israelites had. However, we see the same thing in the New Testament church. We have a God-given responsibility to give to him that has taken care of us, to take care of his church, his pastor. But the fulfillment of that responsibility shouldn't be regulated by law, but by grace. Even though there is a principle of 10% seen in the Bible, God has laid down no 10% rule, no 10% law. Why? Because our giving should not be governed by, by law, but by grace. Paul sums it up best. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. Just touch your neighbor and say, listen up. I think he's talking about you right now. <laughs> you sow sparingly shall also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Let each one of you do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. I used to take that scripture literally. So I become the church, and if you don't want to give God no money, keep it in your pocket. We don't want it. But I've grown since then. <laughs> you guys, you and God, give it anyway, and we'll, we'll pray for your attitude. <laughs> God wants us to give cheerfully. Yet if we're no longer under the law, and grace where law abounds, grace super abound, shouldn't we give more than 10%? The Israelites gave more than 10% under the law. There's no 10% law in the New Testament or really in the Old Testament for that matter. I use 10% as a principle, a minimum for starting. I use 10% because it seems biblical. It is the percentage that comes up most often in the entire Bible. I want you to know so that you don't think I'm doing what I'm not saying or what I'm, just what I'm saying and doing something different. Our family has given more than 10% for years, and we continue to do that. Even when our salary was cut, we continue to give more than 10%. I didn't reduce the tie. Because some people tell you to do something, and guess what? They do something else. So I'm not asking you or telling you to do something that we don't do. I've been in, those, I've been in church a long time. I mean, we, we go in the church, and, and we, we on a fast. A pastor get up, and somebody said, we fast in the day. We fast. I walk. I come out to church, drive out, drive by. They had McDonald's. I thought we was faster. Well, that was for y'all. Now, this is for us, for the, for the believers. Many have the attitude, I just can't afford to give that kind of money to church. I, I should ask you to raise your hand. You can't afford not to. 100% of all that you have comes from God. We are stewards over everything that he has allowed us to have. Like I told him last week, for those of you who all wasn't here, you sitting in church, God moves on your heart and says, give that last dollar. And you, uh-uh, I ain't giving my last dollar. You broke already. You should invest the dollar so that God can bless you because you ain't got enough to get a happy meal. You already broke. But people who are stingy don't understand that principle. 
that sometimes in order to get, you have to give. Yet Uncle Sam takes his off the top, and many of us do what we want to do off the top. But if the Lord is Lord of our lives, if he is giving us life, health, and strength, if he has saved us from our sin and sustains us in our spiritual life, if he is gracious towards us, we ought to feel that 10% is too little rather than too much. When I consider and look back where God has brought me from, when I think over my life and the blessings of my life, then I want to give to God. Now you're saying what kind of, I'm not just talking about financial blessing. One of my greatest blessings in life is that I'm healthy. That's a blessing. Eat what I want. Anything I feel like eating, don't make me sick, pigs, feet, anything. Some folks, every little thing bothers them. Everything, it is a blessing to be healthy. God gives more than simply financial blessing. It's a blessing to be able to lay down your head at night and go to sleep. To have rest. And so we ask each member and constituent of the house of the Lord to give 10%. Approximately 10 to 20% of any congregation, not just the house of the Lord, do that. 10% of us probably tithe. So we're sitting here struggling, our offerings going down every week, and if five or six or six percent of you would just tithe, all of our problems would be over. It would be over. But the problem is that just so few people are willing to do that. And if everyone gave 10 percent, I have to try to figure out what I was going to do with the money. We'd have to say, what are we going to do with this? How are we going to use this overflow? Not only that, 10% is equal sacrifice for every one of us. If you say, everybody, come on, give me $500, everybody can't give $500. And for $500 for some folks is, is nothing. $500 for some folks, they'd have to rob 500 people in order to get it. They don't have it. They couldn't scare it up. So that's not equal sacrifice. Secondarily, if you rob God, it will cost you. When you bless God, he will bless you. But if you rob God, it says here he will curse you. Let's talk a little bit about that because I want to take you to a different level. I want you to understand one thing that the world does not understand and is taught uh, on an ongoing basis and it is absolutely wrong. But it's taught over and over the church. You don't know any better. So when you break a covenant, the covenant is broken. When you break a covenant, what happens? You incur the curses of the covenant. The covenant isn't broken. You're still in the covenant. That's why you're getting the curses of the covenant. So we got these people, I'm done, it's over. It broke. No, that's a contract. In a contract, if one party breaks one side of the contract, the other party is automatically out. Contract is between two people who don't know each other to try to guarantee performance. A covenant is between two parties who know each other intimately who are in an ongoing relationship. Doesn't end the relationship, you get curses. So let's talk about the curse for a little bit. Touch somebody say, I don't want to talk about curses. <laughs> this is probably the curse that was mentioned in Malachi 2 and 2 where God said, I will curse your blessings. The curse of God was upon the nation because of the nature and extent of their sin. There was no, this was no isolated incident. The whole nation was robbing God. Now, the first time, first thing you need to recognize that as we study this is that this is corporate literature to the church. We can apply it to ourselves individually because we're a part of the church. But this wasn't written to individuals. It was written to the church and the nation of Israel. So we should probably first apply it to the nation. It's not the whole nation of America robbing God. Were we founded on the Bible? Do y'all know? Or are you guessing? Okay, who, who went to school? All right, then you know it. We were founded on the Bible. On our money, the last time I checked, it still said, in God we trust. We've been blessed beyond any nation in history, and yet we give so little to God compared to what we spend on ourselves. 
I remember some statistics on religious giving in America that shocked me. And the statistics were that we give something like, on an average in America, 2 to 3% of our income to the church. You said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Bishop, you just said that 10% of the people here tithe, right? 10% of the people in the church. There's a whole lot of folks that guess what? They ain't in the church. So when you average down, you get the average pe person in America might give 2 to 3%. That means a whole lot of folks ain't giving nothing. And there's some folks giving a lot. That's appalling for a nation that is 10% of the world's population using 90% of the world's goods. I just got through reading a book that I want to talk about because I don't want you to quit the church. It's called Profit Over People. And it tells the story of America and how every place that America shows up, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Not, it's not a book that's talking about anecdotes. It's looking at GNP and those kind of things. Every place America shows up. So therefore, we are rich and we are robbing the rest of the nations of the world. I didn't expect to hear that in church. That's the reality. We don't like to face it in America. It's hard. So then that begins to help us understand we don't know how blessed we are. Can I try it on for size for a moment? Yeah. Bananas do not grow in America. <laughs> except in deep southern climate. Yet you go to your grocery store every week. Where are the banana lovers at? And you look in this fine what? Bananas. Go on out there on Diagonal Road, see if you can find a banana. Go down Copley, go down. There are no bananas there. Those things are imported. And the imports cost lots of money and in some cases are raping other nations. That's one product. When you go to the store, how many products do you see? And yet we come to church or we turn to God and give back nothing for all of those blessings. Because we are robbing God by not obeying him. He says he will curse us. So I'm not talking about us first. I'm talking about America. Can I read you the curse? No. You should say, no, don't read it to me. I don't want to hear it. Deuteronomy 28, 15. I'm let the Bible talk. When I talk, people say, well, you know, he, 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 let's let God talk. But it shall come about, if you do not obey the Lord your God to observe and do all his commandments and his statutes, which I charge you today, that all these curses will come upon you and will overtake you. Curse shall you be in the city. Curse shall you be in the country. Curse shall you be a giant eagle and in your, your kneading bowl. Well, it says your basket. Curse shall be the offspring of your body and the produce of your ground, the increase of your herd and the young of your flock. Curse shall you be when you come in. Curse shall you be when you go out. The Lord will send upon you curses, confusion, rebuke, and all you undertake to do until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly on account of all the evil deeds because you have forsaken me. The Lord will make pestilence cling to you until he has consumed you from the land where you are entering to possess. Stop, Bishop, please stop. The Lord will smite you. I'm just reading the Bible with consumption, with fever, with inflammation, with fiery heat, with the sword, with blight, with mildew, and they will pursue you until you perish. The heaven which is over your head shall be bronze, and the earth which is under you iron. The Lord will make rain of your land, powder and dust. From heaven it shall come down on you until you are destroyed. I'm going to keep reading, but I'm doing some comments along the way here. So do, maybe we're not being blessed like we think we ought to be blessed because maybe we're not uh, obeying God. The Lord shall cause you to be defeated before your enemies, America. You will go out one way against them, but you will flee seven ways before them. You will be an example of terror to all the kingdoms. Your carcasses will be food. I can't take no more. I'm going to stop. It's too much because y'all getting overwhelmed and I see you sinking down. You could go on from verses 28 through 44. All that God said I will do. Excuse me, 46. So let me help you out. That's a, you're welcome. 
This is America. America no longer holds the prestigious position it used to hold in the world. We're in trouble and don't even know it. The nations of the earth hate us. And we don't know why. Because of the way that we operate in the earth. And yet, we don't thank God for allowing us to have all of the stuff that we have. Let's come to us. Here we are, saved folks. Not only blessed, not only eating bananas. Got salvation. My future secure in God and yet not giving to him. But I got news for you that ought to help you from Wednesday night if you had come on Wednesday. The difference between you and America is that because you are saved, Jesus is your curse absorber. The reason that you are not destroyed the reason that the curses do not come down and destroy you is because you got Jesus in your life. And Jesus absorbs the curses through the blood of Jesus Christ. And therefore, because of his mercy, we are not destroyed. I wish somebody ought to praise God about that. God blesses us. Even when we don't give to him. Even when we're stingy. God doesn't stop blessing us. What a mighty God he is. What a gracious God he is. But there are still conditions for certain blessings. Now, we don't teach that. What we teach everybody, I want a blessing. I want a blessing. Just pray for me that I will be blessed. I can pray for you to be blessed. But if you want to be blessed, there are certain things you need to do to put yourself in position for the blessing. Now, there are some blessings that God passes out freely. But even favor has got some conditions to it. That's not what we teach. We teach grace is free. You know, I think for the free grace of God, free. That's American. In the Bible, favor and grace means that you are obligated to do certain things. God doesn't just pass it out and then walk away. He passes it out and expects you to return to him. Expects you to tell everybody you know about him expects you to praise him expects you to honor him now he will bless you sometime even when you don't but sometimes just so we understand he will stop it just like you how many y'all got children you love your children you bless your children you ever get mad at them and pull the blessing <laughs> you ever come to the end of your rope and say I'm, and I'm not giving you nothing else I'm blessing you I'm giving you I'm trying to take care of you I try to help you go through school I do and they tell they turn around and particularly when they teenager and look at you and say you ain't done nothing for me but the mama there and there's a young man he's going to stand up against his mama he's like he want to fight her and what mama do? Okay, I'm talking about African Americans right now. I, I want to be, I know we kind of confused right here. You know. what, what does mama do? She says, I will bless you, son. You may curse me, but I will bless you. You may curse me, but I will steal. Your name shall be wonderful in my mouth. Every, I'm talking about African Americans right now, right? No, because we got high, high emotional responses. Boy, do you know I will kill you. There won't be nothing left of you when I get done. Okay, that, that's African-American folk. And then you think God is saying something different to you? You don't think he ever gets tired. Now, he is long-suffering. But that doesn't mean that he is ever suffering. I 
I said, we're talking honest today, right? So therefore, in verse 10, he said, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Bring it all. Because some of y'all, you ain't bringing the whole tithe. When you don't come to church, them tithes get lost. And they don't come back with you. You're pinching off of them and I said, why are you all looking so guilty? And not giving all that you should give. I know that because when we first started tithing, I understood that. It's kind of rough. But just pinch them tithes a little bit. Rather than giving 10%, why don't you give nine? Now what if God said, okay, rather than giving you 100% of the air, I'll just give you 90. Rather than blessing you all like I'm blessing you, I just, I'm just take a little bit away from it. But he, we depend upon him for everything we have. So he said, here's what I want you to do. Why do you want to do that? Why is he commanding? Because I want to have provision, number one. He wanted the whole tithe so there would be food in his house. God wanted the temple to be well furnished. In the New Testament church, that we are not the storehouse, but we are the main place for receiving the designated gifts of God. So God wants to bless the New Testament church. Do you think he wants the church to be scrounging, begging, can't hardly make it. Number two, he said, I want you to prove me. Test me. And see if I will not open the windows of heaven. And pour you out a blessing. You don't have room to receive. How many people believe that? Anybody here believe that? Y'all just said, he, he will bless. Oh, that's the wrong crowd. That's the next crowd. Some of y'all look like y'all believe it in here. That if you cheerfully give to God, he will bless you. I am a witness. I'm a living witness. That I believe my blessings flow from many things. But one of them is ongoing tithing. For 50 years at least. And when you tithe, God said, just prove me. So we got a challenge. Last Sunday was your sacrificial offering. Tell me I ain't done that yet. But we'll wait for you. This Sunday is, God said, prove me, a challenge. Don't, don't just take it for granted. Try it out. So tithe for six months and see what God will do. Now, a lot of y'all, I, I tried at one time. <laughs> you gave one off, one time, and then went to the mailbox and stood on Monday morning. <laughs> Lord, where's my blessing? I'm waiting on my blessing now. Send it quick. This is a principle that is a lifestyle principle. It's not a rule, it's not a law, it's a principle. He said, try me out. See if I will not open the windows of heaven. I don't know about you, but does anybody here need an open window in heaven that God is pouring out <laughs> blessings? And so we come to the culmination. When the Israelites had followed the command of the Lord, the culmination would be seen in the blessing of the Lord. I'm reading again through the Bible, and I'm ahead. I got ahead because I started reading a particular Bible, and I decided to read so many chapters, and so I'm done. So I'm reading not this year for next year, and I'm reading another uh, Bible version that I found that's very interesting. And as I'm reading through here, I'm, I'm, I'm always arrested by the fact, this is, this, this is very interesting, how God protects and blesses. And he told the children of Israel, three times a year, I want you to come up in festival. And during those three times a year, I want you to come up and don't come empty-handed. All right, just turn to about three people and say, don't come up in here empty-handed. <laughs> Bring something with you when you come. Because you know folks is coming to church empty-handed. No come empty hand. <laughs> but watch this. this. I mean, this is fascinating to me. It just might be me. It might not, it might not be you. It might not get it. It might just be me. 
And he said, what I will do for you is that you will never be attacked while you're at festival. Now, they were among all kinds of enemies, surrounded by enemies. He said, when you go to festival, nobody will attack you. I will protect you and make sure that you are protected while you are away blessing, honoring, and giving to me. Somebody ought to get a blessing right there and say that when I'm doing what God wants me to do, God has a principle of protecting me. I thought I'd get a bigger shout than that. Evidently, you don't need no protection. Evidently, you're all right. Evidently, you don't have any enemies. Evidently, everything's going good with you. Well, that's America. But there might be one or two people in here, let me talk to, who need some protection. There might be two or three people in here that need a window opened in heaven. There might be a few folks in here that say, I want to be where God can bless me. I want to get near the spout where the blessings are coming out because I need some. All of us who are about to be on fixed income. Y'all sure need a blessing. Excuse me. We sure need a blessing because there ain't no raises coming. Your income is fixed. And yet price of, 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 of the cost of living keeps rising. Prices keep rising. Everything's going up, but your dollars, you need God to go in there and fix some stuff for you sometime. So when the Israelites follow the command of the Lord, the culmination, he said, the blessing. There were three things he said, I will do. He said, I'll protect your crops from any pests that might destroy the crops and from anything that might cause the fruit to fall from the vine prematurely, causing a loss of crop. God said, I'll protect the stuff that you got so that the, the, the pest can't eat it up. I'm going to protect it. The roaches ain't going to even eat up. Your... What's wrong with y'all? Oh, I forgot. Some of y'all don't have no roaches. Okay, y'all, this, is, this is a more sophisticated crowd. Okay, we don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. But there are also financial roaches. Economic roaches, there's all kinds of there's health roaches, there are all kinds of things that eat up what God would want you to have. And God said, I'll protect you. Number two, provision. I will cause this house to be full of provision as he promised in, the ver in verse 10. I don't know about you, but my house is full of provisions. Full. There's nothing, if the problem, it ain't in there if it's not full because I don't want it. Half the stuff in there I ain't eating. Your house is full of provision. You got food in your cabinet for ages that you're not eating. Catch up with, with past dates, expiration dates, and mustard, and all uh, just in the cabinet. Y'all stop me when I'm lying. Just full of it. Pull the cabinet back. You go get groceries. You can't even put the groceries in there. You got it. And half the stuff that's in there, you're not eating anyway. You are blessed. Do you think the countries of the world have that kind of blessing? And we ought to thank God every time you open that cabinet. Every time you eat, you ought to pray. You, you ought not to just be, you know, gracious Lord, we're truly thankful for the blessing we're about to receive for the earth and our body in Christ. Say, God, God. You ought to stop and pray. Thank you, Lord. Were it not for you on my side, I don't know what I'd be right now. I don't know what I'd have to eat if it wasn't for you. Because I got news for you that maybe you haven't figured out yet. You didn't have to be born in America. I know you feel like you do and you're that, you know, I, I'm entitled. But you didn't have to be born here. Why God allowed you to be born here? And he allowed you to, 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 to suck up and, and slap up and slurp up his blessing and give nothing back to him. I don't know, but he's a gracious God. And then he said, number three, I will give you proof. The blessing will overflow until other nations will become aware of it. It will not be isolated from just or just in you and other folks can't see it, but they'll begin to see what's going on. I want to end by giving these three to you then. If you 
Read 2 Corinthians 9, 6. It says that God loves a cheerful giver. And if you give cheerfully, it promises the same three, three things. Let me promise them to you. Let me give them to you. If you obey God's commandments, he will protect your goods and make them last. Maybe you can't remember, but I can. When our money was low and we didn't know how we were going to make it. I can remember. I haven't forgotten. I know some of us, you get blessed for so long, you forget where you came from. But the old folks in the Baptist said, my soul looks back and I wonder how I got over because I can't even figure out in some of those days how I made it through. How did we make it through that situation? But God is such a gracious God that he will come in and I'm in the midst of something, can't figure out how to get through. He will turn the page and I'm out. And, I'm, and I don't even know I'm out. And I got to give him praise. I got to give him thanks. I got to give him glory. Make stuff laugh, last. Oh, I don't, I don't have to brown bag it no more. Where you just go in there and get the little bit of whatever you can put together and put it in the bag and carry it with you. And God is good. There was a time in our lives where we wasn't going to movies, we wasn't going to this, we wasn't going nowhere. Yo, watching that seven inch TV. With the hanger. Oh, come on, somebody. Come on, some, come on somebody right now. I, I think I just touched somebody right there with a hanger, trying to turn the hanger. Oh, I think I'm going to talk. <laughs> I'm going to help somebody here in a minute. Just, just trying to turn the hanger. Now you got cable. Large screen. TV, high definition. I remember the, the antenna. I remember when you got to go over and hit the thing. <laughs> Try to get a picture out of it. And then it be humming. Mm. Come on, somebody. I'm going I'm to help somebody in a minute. Now, now look at you. Now look what God has done. Glory to God. <laughs> I hope I remember this in second service. It won't matter because they won't know what I'm talking about. They're, they're all young. They don't know. It. All they've ever seen is, is big screen TVs and, 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 and all this stuff and phones and cell phones and Facebook. And, and they don't understand that. They don't know. when There wasn't no such thing as a cell phone. They don't know anything about that. So they won't know what I'm talking about, but I'm going to talk about it anyway because they ought to know. They ought to know. Now, I personally, I shouldn't even tell you this, but, but you need to understand where we are right now. I have cable and satellite. Because I got, I can't tell y'all too much, you'll be acting up on me. Because my electronic equipment is so good and I don't want to be down. I got cable and satellite, because satellite will go out on you. All y'all satellite, just before you switch. When the weather changes, the satellite, something happens. Now you ain't got nothing. I just pick up my remote control, go over the cable then. All right. Well, moving on then. We can't, I can't mess with them. I like satellite, but they, that's what a blessing. Folks dying, and I got two, two forms of, come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. I, I don't eat anymore. I, I, don't, I don't eat at the regular stuff. I go to Earth Fair, stay out my store, and, and get free-range beef and chicken. And I don't want none with hormones and antibiotics. 
shot in there. I don't want that. That's a blessing. I'm just trying to get somebody to understand how blessed you are. What God said he will do. Then he said, I will bless you with prosperity. That means I will give you more than enough. That means I will make nine tenths go further than ten tenths. Somebody get your calculator out right quick and help me out. Because you're saying, I'm keeping ten, I'm keeping all of mine, and you can't make it. You saying I'm keeping all of mine and the ends don't meet. Yet there are some of us who are giving away a tenth, more than a tenth, and God is stretching it. And nine tenths will go further than ten. You know, you say, I don't understand that. You can't understand it. You have to experience it. And then he said, Proof of God's blessing in other lives, you will see it. I believe that you can see. I said, I believe you can see that I'm blessed. And part of that blessing is for tithing for over 50 years and offering. Now, I'm not even talking about offering. I'm just talking about tithe. We also give offerings. We also, our family, gives money to people on an ongoing basis. People who are hurting, people around us that have issues, let's bless them. Let's bless so-and-so. Let's, let's bless now, you can't do that unless you got more than enough or you're sharing out of what you have. We have more than enough to share with other people. Let's prove God by giving 10% for six months and see what he will do. And all who are unwilling to do that, you say, I ain't doing nothing. Pray that God arrest you for armed robbery. He'll arrest you in the spirit. Bring you to where he wants you to be. So you can be blessed. Heads bowed, eyes closed. The greatest blessing in the world is salvation. I said the greatest blessing in the world is salvation. And Jesus died that you might be saved. If you want to know him today, you say, you talk enough about his goodness. I think I want to know him. Just pray with me right now and say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for every sin that I've sinned against you. Come in my life, save me, make me the person you want me to be. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for giving me eternal life. I receive you as Savior and Lord. If you prayed that in a minute, I'm so excited for you today right now. I don't know what to do. Just get up and come on down. These folks that are standing here will pray with you. If you need a church home, get up and come down. They will pray with you. You don't have to come down to be saved. Salvation is a matter of a heart transaction. It's between you and